in under a year and a half between 1996 and 1997, 18-year-old Sarah Spears, 23-year-old Jane Rimmer, and 27-year-old Sierra Glenn disappeared one by one in the same area of Claremont, a wealthy suburb of Perth. What started off as a missing mystery of a young woman in Claremont, Perth soon came out to be something more serious as the investigation proceeded. Were these disappearances connected to each other? What actually happened to these young women? In today's video, we will be discussing one of the most notorious cases in the history of Australia, the Claremont murders. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to the channel, please go and hit the subscribe button and the bell icon down below. And now without further ado, let's get started. Claremont is a western suburb of Perth. Claremont is surrounded by Airline Street to the south, Alfred Road to the north, Lock Street and Bay Road to the east, and Stirling Highway, Camden Street, and Stirling Road to the west. The majority of Claremont is primarily made up of residential areas. Although there is also a significant shopping center along Stirling Highway as well as the Claremont Showground in eastern portion of Lake Claremont. The Claremont Showground and Claremont Oval, the Lake Claremont Football Club's home field, are also located here. There is also an important commercial district along Stirling Highway, primarily in the St. Quentin Avenue area. Along with various bars, the area is home to the Claremont Hotel. On the terrace and Hotel Bayview. Hotel Bayview is the place where one of the most spine-chilling cases of Australia took place from 1996 to 1997. Sarah Spears was born on September 12, 1977. She grew up in a rural area of Western Australia where her father, Don Spears, was a shearing contractor headquartered in Darkin in the state's wheat belt. As their children reached high school age, the Spears, like so many other rural families, sent their kids to boarding school in Perth where Sarah eventually enrolled in Ionia Presentation College located in Mossman Park. She joined the secretarial school after completing her graduation before landing a position as a receptionist at BSD, an engineering firm in Sabicio. She was living in a South Perth flat in 1996 with her eldest sister, Amanda, to whom she was close, just as she was with her parents. Jane Rimmer was born on October 12, 1972, to Trevor Rimmer and Jenny Rimmer. She was raised in Shenton Park and went to Rosalie Primary School and then Hollywood High School while working part-time in a deli close by. Jane worked as a child care worker in Nedland as she was fond of children and enjoyed their company. Later, she worked as a nanny for a family in Esper. However, when her job there was complete, she came back to Nedland as a child care worker again. Tragically, this was the time that she disappeared after having a night out with her friends in the Continental Hotel. On that fateful night of June 9, 1996, Sierra Glenn was born on November 20, 1969. She was raised in the wealthy Riverside suburb of Mossman Park and then moved to Perth when she was six or seven years old. She was born in Zambia to Irish parents, Dennis Glennon and Unagelnon. She received a highly sought-after internship at the legal firm Blake Dawson Waldron after graduating from UWA in 1992 with degrees in both law and Japanese. She started working there in early 1993. Her father, Mr. Glenn, described Sierra as resourceful, resilient, and strong-willed. She was acknowledged as a passionate woman with high spirit and possessing a great sense of humor by her friends. She disappeared on March 15, 1997 from Claremont. The case began on January 20, 1996, at about 2 a.m. when Sarah Spears left Club Bayview in Claremont, Western Australia, after having a fun night out with her friends. At 2.06 a.m., she placed a call for a taxi from a public phone booth to request transportation to Mossman Park, a nearby suburb, to stay with one of her friends. But she wasn't there when the taxi arrived to pick her up at the location at 2.09 a.m. She was seen waiting by herself near the intersection of Stirling Road and Stirling Highway, according to three witnesses in a vehicle. The next day, none of her close ones got any updates from her. That was very unlike Sarah as she was quite family-oriented and close with her friends. After the night of January 20, 1996, her sister never heard from her. That's when the case was taken up by the major crime squad of Western Australia after her family filed a missing persons report. The fact that it was 2.06 a.m. when Sarah called for a taxi and she was nowhere to be found at 2.09 a.m. when the taxi arrived at the location was alarming. What could have happened in just those three minutes? Sarah Spears' case was taken up by the major crime squad within 48 hours of her disappearance. The department left no stone unturned when it came to chasing down leads. 
They were desperate for anything that would help the Spears family get an update or any news related to Sarah's disappearance. However, nothing worked. Sarah was not found and slowly Sarah's disappearance turned out to be one of those cases that go cold with no leads for the crime department to follow through on. There was no physical evidence, no CCTV footage, not even a definite witness that would have given the authorities any information that could lead to the truth behind the disappearance of Sarah Spears. However, just four and a half months later, another case with a missing young lady was reported on June 9, 1996, from the same area of Claremont. 23-year-old Jane Rimmer, who was a child care worker, was last seen in the Continental Hotel of Claremont after a night out with her friends. She had disappeared from a street in the area on her way back home. The major crime squad was now able to see a pattern in these disappearances of young women from the same area, which led them to investigate thoroughly in the neighborhood of Claremont. Jane's family was as troubled as Sarah's family when she went missing from the same area of Claremont. In fact, just like Sarah, even Jane was quite close to her family and kept regular contact. Although she had moved out from home, she had a very warm relationship with her parents and would spend most of her weekends at her family's home enjoying Sunday lunch together with her family. Jane was adored by her parents and that reflected in her personality. The major crime squad was looking for any possible clues like eyewitnesses and taxi drivers who were either last contacted or witnesses. Till August 3, 1996, the disappearance of these two young women was just a serious missing persons case of Claremont. However, the case took a serious turn when Jane's body was found by a family in a bushland only 40 kilometers away from Claremont on the said date. The grim discovery was made by the Van Ralt Evans family when they were driving through semi-rural land in Wellard, which is about 40 kilometers south of Perth. Tammy Van Ralt Evans the mother rolled down a bush path as the kids played because she was attracted to the largest death lily she had ever seen. She noticed a person's feet while she admired the lily and what she called a bush cocoon. And as she looked deeper into the bushes, she discovered Jane, laying naked and hidden behind branches. After the body was discovered, the major crime squad was notified and a large team reached the location immediately to retrieve the body for autopsy and commenced the investigation. Discovering Jane's body was considered the second phase of the case. The area where the body was found was investigated thoroughly for any clue that would lead to the killer. Police were hopeful that it might lead them to finding Sarah, as commented by Detective Paul Ferguson, who was in charge of the case at that time. Pathwest pathologist Clive Cook confirmed that it was murder as a deep wound from a sharp object was found on her throat along with defensive wounds which suggested that Jane tried fighting back against the killer. Moreover, the forensic department could not retrieve any trace of sexual assault as the body was decomposed severely. In order to investigate the case, Western Australian police created the Macro Task Force. A telecom knife was found less than a kilometer away from the crime scene on Woolcote Road, which proved to be the murder weapon. In addition, on the fateful night that Jane was killed, two couples who resided in Wellard told authorities they heard a lady screaming and shouting. After hearing a lady yell, leave me alone, let me out of here. Kenneth Mitchell claimed he saw a car drive off in the direction of the area where Miss Rimmer's corpse was discovered. In fact, in that same area, another couple told the investigators that they remembered hearing cries that stopped mid-scream. All these witnesses, evidence, and forensic results suggested that the murder was done using a sharp tool, which was likely a knife. Fast forward to March 15, 1997, nine months after Jane Rimmer's disappearance. Another young woman, Sierra Glenn, age 27, disappeared from the same area of Claremont while returning home after a night out with her friends at the Continental Hotel. Sierra was last seen strolling by herself on Sterling Highway in search of a cab at about midnight on March 14, 1997. The missing persons case was immediately taken over by the Macro Task Force. Her father, Dennis Glenn, attended a press conference where he appealed for help to find his daughter. He said the way she has been brought up, she will fight. On April 3, 1997, the corpse of lawyer Sierra Glenn, 27, was discovered partially buried in undergrowth in a bushland area north of Perth just 19 days after her disappearance. Near Pippadini Road in Egelenton, a tiny limestone trail led to the discovery of Miss Glenn's body. Former senior pathologist Karen Margolius observed that the body of Miss Glenn was discovered completely dressed. However, her black skirt looked to have been pushed up around her waist. She was decked out with jewelry, including a gold chain bracelet, earrings, a watch, and a navel ring. 
Prior to her death, Sierra Glenn was momentarily stunned by an object that broke her skull. She had a similar wound on her throat as Jane Rimmer. Forensics connected fibers taken from Miss Glenn's and Miss Rimmer's bodies and found them to be the same. They also found DNA beneath Miss Glennon's fingernails that they believed belonged to the killer. Her skin had split in a few places and her thumbnail was ripped and cracked. It is inferred that Sierra Glenn attempted to defend herself, which is how she sustained these injuries. Photos of the area were then given to the larger court, revealing a number of damaged trees where branches appeared to have been severed in order to bury Miss Glennon's body. The investigation continued and it was clear after Sierra's disappearance that it was indeed the work of the same culprit. The macro task force was now sprinting to find the culprit and prevent another murder from happening. One of the primary suspects was Lance William, who was followed by the task force at 3 o'clock on a Sunday as he was roaming around the streets of Claremont in his car. He was driving through the streets without any purpose and certain strange behaviors like driving about after midnight and doing up to 30 rounds in the Claremont region made him seem suspicious to the task force. There were also sexually motivated behaviors like offering women lifts that contributed to the suspicion that was growing among the police force as they followed him. When the media and news agencies got a hold of him, they asked direct questions which William answered without any hesitation. He was asked if he was the serial killer which he denied and then he was asked if he was innocent, which he agreed on. He was also asked about how his life had changed from the time he was marked as a prime suspect in the Claremont serial killing in the eyes of the police. He answered by saying it was quite distressing for him and his family. Although the police highly doubted the intention of Lance William, the absence of any evidence and the context of the forensics made it clear that he was not the same man the macro task force was looking for. As the women were last seen in situations where they may have taken taxis, suspicion subsequently turned to Perth's taxi drivers. Among them was a driver who claimed to have picked up Sarah the night before she vanished. The hundreds of registered taxi drivers in Western Australia were then subjected to extensive fingerprint and DNA examinations. Considering the proof of several unauthorized operators, the eligibility standards were strengthened and 78 drivers with substantial criminal records had their licenses revoked. Also, stricter criteria were used to ensure that the equipment and logo of decommissioned taxis were removed. After months of relentless searching, there was not a single piece of evidence that could point the police in a definite direction to move in. In fact, in 2004, after seven years of failing to find the killer, the WA police considered disbanding the macro task force but delayed this and waited for an independent review of the case. That led to some prominent raids within a short period police ultimately decided not to disband the task force. The report was subjected to several independent reviews over the years, including one by some of Australia's greatest investigators. The panel consisted of two experts from Australia, two forensic experts from the UK, and one psychological profiler. Was there a chance of getting the right lead that would help the investigators to identify the killer, or was this case going to fizzle out? After years of investigating, the special task force along with the assistance of the finest forensic experts in the country were able to identify one piece of evidence that gave a new direction to the case. When they ran a sample from Glenn's fingernails through the Western Australia database in 2008, they discovered that it matched the samples from a victim who was assaulted and was left alive by the offender at a cemetery in 1995, the year before the killings had started. Now they had a suspect's DNA. Detectives combed through cold cases to see whether the murderer may have been involved in any previous crimes. An 18-year-old was attacked in bed at her family's hunting house in southeast Perth in an unsolved case from 1988. The intruder fled when the woman yelled for her father. Although the intruder did not assault the woman, he left behind a kimono that he had stolen from a clothing line out of fear. The authorities needed to determine whose DNA was in the samples after they realized the attacks were connected. They did this by analyzing a fingerprint that was collected from the Huntingdale Properties' doorknob in 1998. The fingerprints of Bradley Robert Edward, who had been on record after attacking a hospital employee in 1990, were discovered to match in 2008. This faceless man who had been the mind behind the brutal killing of three innocent souls in Claremont was named Bradley Robert Edward. Along with his parents, younger brother, and sister, Bradley grew up in Huntingdale. Bradley continued his father's career at Telstra by working there as a technician for the entirety of his professional career. Edwards turned into a peeping Tom when he was still residing in Huntingdale with his family. He started by stealing undergarments. 
Bradley, though, experienced his first run-in with the law soon before getting married. At Hollywood Hospital, where he was working on a Telstra project, he attacked Wendy Davis 40 in 1980. Young Bradley, who was a Telstra employee, approached Wendy and she sat at her desk and asked if he could use the restroom behind her desk. Wendy responded by saying yes and continued to work. Wendy was abruptly grasped from behind and pulled hysterically in the direction of the restrooms. She fought back and gave the perpetrator a powerful kick. After letting her go, Bradley apologized. Bradley was arrested once the police arrived and he was ordered to undergo 12 months of therapy. A few days after the incident, Wendy was contacted by Bradley who apologized for his actions. Bradley nevertheless kept his position. In actuality, he received a promotion shortly after. He gave the reason that his fiancée was forcing him to be married as an explanation for his actions at the time. They got married shortly after that. After marrying quite young, Bradley settled in a place that was close to his parents' residence in Huntingdale, but the union did not last long. Bradley's wife felt abandoned as a result of his obsession with his computer. She started dating when a male friend of hers moved in to help them with rent and bills. The wife left the house with her boyfriend in 1996. Soon after that happened, Sarah Spires vanished. A few months later, Bradley's now ex-wife called him to inform him that she was expecting a child with the man she had left him for. Jane River went missing shortly after that. Sierra's murder took place when he ended his relationship with a woman who he had been seeing during the first few months of 1997. Considering the matches to be significant proof an undercover operation to collect Edwards's DNA came next. He left an empty Sprite bottle outside the movie theater when he went to the movies and when the cops saw it, they swooped in and obtained it for examining his DNA. DNA was taken and it was apparently found to match the DNA profile of the unknown male that was found under Sierra's fingernails. This was the proof police needed and Bradley Robert Edwards, age 52, was arrested on December 20, 2016, and then was put on trial three years after the arrest. As the trial began, the prosecution requested that Edwards be tried without a jury in the form of a judge-alone trial. It was due to the case's prominence and the gruesome nature of the evidence. The application was approved. On November 20, 5, 2019, in front of Judge Stephen Hall of the Supreme Court, the murder trial began. While the defense claimed the evidence was tainted in the lab, there was no denying that Bradley's DNA was also discovered under Sierra's fingernails and also matched the kimono. The Telstra work vans were one of the key pieces of evidence. It was alleged that Edwards, a technician at the time, committed the offenses using corporate vehicles after hours. A security guard who saw the telecom van stop at the Karakata graveyard on many occasions for no apparent purpose, both after the 1995 incident and before Spire's 1996 disappearance, verified this. Carmel Barbagallo, the prosecutor, said that between 1995 and 1997, a guy driving a Telstra station wagon stopped to look at ladies and offer them rides. The state submitted this evidence as part of the Telstra Living Witness Project case. The fact that the blue polyester fibers found at the crime scene on the bodies of both Jane and Sierra matched with the Telstra station wagon that Bradley owned only firmed his direct connection with the murders. Edwards operated a Telstra-branded white V-Series fan from April 1996 until December 1998. On the same day of his arrest, the car was located and seized. The defense argued that these fibers could have come from another source or another vehicle that was not listed in the WA crime database. But it was revealed during the hearing that the carpet fibers found in the back of Edwards' car matched those found on both Rimmer and Glennon's bodies. Bradley's defense team claimed that because Bradley's DNA had been present in the lab ever since the 1995 assault, the samples of Miss Glennon's fingernails that were taken throughout the inquiry were contaminated. Many of the scientists who worked at Perth's Path West facility where the DNA was tested were cross-examined by attorney Paul Yavich in court over their procedures. Edward was a Telstra technician who primarily served the Telco's government clients, and Mr. Yovic had speculated that Edwards may have been in the lab. However, with the help of the right witnesses and a series of well-structured pieces of evidence, the prosecutors were able to disprove these arguments. After seven months of hearings and more than 200 witness depositions, the trial ended on June 20, 2020. After that, Judge Hall left the courtroom to reflect before delivering a decision before Bradley's detention in jail expired on September 20, 2020. Edward was found guilty of the murders of Jane and Sierra but not of Sarah Spires. 
In a 619-page written verdict delivered by Hall on the last day of detention, though it was more likely that Bradley was indeed directly related in her disappearance than not. Bradley was given a life sentence with the possibility of release after 40 years on December 23, 2020. The possibility that Hall will pass away in prison is high according to Hall. Although the criminal Bradley Robert Edward was sentenced to 40 years of prison time, it is important to understand the psychology of the criminal. Miss Barbagallo argues it is important because the date of the crimes and behavior directly reflected on the emotional distress in his personal life. The timeline was presented in the court later in the trial. The incident at Hollywood Hospital happened the day after Bradley learned that his ex-girlfriend had strayed in the 1980s. In 1994, Bradley's first wife started an extramarital relationship after he reportedly grew aloof and spent too much time on his computer. In 1995, January or February, her lover moved into their marriage house. The Caracatta assault case was reported in the same year shortly after her. Sarah Spears' disappearance in 1996, just a few days after his wife left him. Jane disappeared and was murdered just a few days after Bradley discovered his estranged wife was pregnant with a baby whose father was the same man she left Bradley for in 1996. In the second half of 1996, Bradley began an intimate relationship with a woman who was 20 years his senior. It ended in March 1997 and that was the time when Sierra Glenn went missing and was found killed. The prosecution claimed that no other murders were committed after Bradley met his second wife in April 1997, barely one month after Sierra's death. This timeline of events does give a clear insight into Bradley's state of mind while committing the crimes in Claremont. Nothing reduces the pain of losing a child. The parents and the family members of the victims suffered for years for their loss. Yet, they stood resilient enough to see justice being served. Although Sarah Spears' body was nowhere to be found and Bradley bluntly denied the murder of the deceased, it was clear to the court that he was indeed the person behind the murder. However, the court could not offer any justice for Sarah's murder due to the lack of evidence. Yet, forensic science and the police department stand out for their consistency in this case, which brought justice to the innocent souls that were butchered by this killer. In an age where people are losing faith in our existing justice system, this case stands out and offers hope for a system that still cradles morality and principles as the base. Tell us how you feel about this case in the comments section. On May 24, 1985, a school teacher on the way to work found an injured and unconscious woman in a ditch in Newton, Baker County, Georgia. The woman, who had sustained severe head injuries, was still alive. She succumbed to her brutal injuries in the hospital. Unable to track her identity, the community of Newton started referring to her as Baker County Jane Doe. Years went by, but no one could identify the woman. It was not until 2023 when Baker County Jane Doe was finally identified. What had happened to her? How did the officials identify her? After all these years? Today, we are looking into the heart-wrenching story of Baker County Jane Doe, who has finally been identified after 37 years. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now without any further ado, let's reveal the mystery. The place of picturesque abundance, Baker County is home to about 28,000 people. It offers a plethora of natural recreational facilities for residents and tourists alike, known for its rich cultural history. Baker County houses generational families, providing the lowest cost of living in Florida. Baker County is the first choice of families due to its proximity to major cities and higher institutions of learning, making education and employment easily accessible. Baker County boasts a full-fledged holistic lifestyle. This is where today's story begins. One fine morning of May 24, 1985, a school teacher was going to work driving along Highway 91 in Baker County, Georgia. It was a rural outpost approximately 200 miles south of Atlanta. The school teacher pulled over after noticing a body in the ditch on the west side of the road. It was a woman. She was unconscious and looked badly injured. On closer inspection, she seemed to be barely breathing. Nonetheless, she was alive. After reaching out to emergency services, she was rushed to the Phoebe Putney Hospital in Albany, Georgia with the help of an ambulance. She had no ID with her. Therefore, the investigators listed her as a Jane Doe. They had hoped it would be a temporary name for her as they believed she would regain consciousness and inform them about herself and how she ended up in a ditch. Little did they know that she would carry that name for another 37 years after she remained in a coma and succumbed to her injuries on June 1, 1985. 
The woman did not seem to be sexually assaulted or physically beaten up. She had multiple abrasions on her face, arms, and back, along with severe head trauma that turned out to be the cause of her death, but the manner of her death remains a mystery to this day. Baker County Jane Doe had apparently slid off a tanker truck about 60 feet above ground and sustained severe blunt force trauma to the head. The possibility of a hit and run had not been overruled, but there was no evidence to support any potential theory. Some officers believed that someone could have pushed her off the truck. However, these theories were mere speculations. What happened on May 24, 1985, was just anyone's guess. The injured woman found in the ditch wore a gray t-shirt paired with Britannia blue jeans. It had a laundry tag that read Allison Miles. So initially, she was referred to as Allison Miles, but as the case proceeded and no leads were found, she became a Jane Doe. When she was discovered in the ditch, she had white socks and sneakers on. The woman was also wearing a white, blue, and red bandana. There was a pillow by her side that resembled the pillows of hotels. It raised some suspicions of foul play, but there was neither any confirmation nor possible lead. The police were not sure about relating the pillow to her. Though it was found in the same ditch, it had been 20 yards away from her. The search for the identity of Jane Doe began with the Baker County Sheriff's Office. The day she was admitted to the hospital, the police department set out to seek her identity. With the help of GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, her picture from the hospital was released to the public. She was estimated to be a Caucasian woman in her late 20s to 30s with a fair complexion, blue eyes, and brown to dark blonde hair. She had a slim build and weighed approximately 110 to 120 pounds. She measured to be 5 feet 6 inches tall and her abdomen and buttocks had stretch marks indicating that she could have been a mother or had a family. Some tan lines were also noticed. The investigators received several calls during the initial days. Some claimed she appeared familiar, while others just wanted to relate and inquire about their missing loved ones. A man called the police, claiming that the description sounded like that of his ex-wife. But none of the theories led the police anywhere. During the ongoing investigation, Jane Doe died on June 1, 1985. The medical examiner's office revealed that the cause of death was subdural hematoma secondary to blunt force trauma to the head. There were no signs of attack or sexual assault. She was buried as Jane Doe in Newton City Cemetery. The headstone of her grave read Jane Doe, June 1, 1985, and was taken care of by the community in the hopes that her real family would find her soon. From 1985 over the years, police did everything to find the real name of Jane Doe. They initially checked her fingerprints, but no match was found. So they released her picture to the public, but it did not lead to the case going any further. Several sketches were created and distributed, but every lead fizzled out too quickly. Even after all the struggle, the police did not give up on her. In 2008, the case was assigned to Baker County Sheriff Dana Mead, who was dedicated to finding out the identity of Jane Doe. So he appealed to the GBI to reinspect her case and find out anything that was possible. Almost four years went by. Then in September of 2012, the remains of Baker County Jane Doe were exhumed. The authorities were seeking samples to test. With the help of a bone fragment, a stable isotope analysis was performed by a private company. Around the same time, in March 2013, Baker County Jane Doe was given profile number up 11097 on the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, NamUs. Nothing of substance followed the step. The isotope analysis looked at the oxygen and strontium isotope ratios to indicate information on the last 10-year history of her drinking water. It was an effort to lead the police to some probable areas where she might have lived. The predictions of the analysis excluded states in the southeast, including Georgia and Florida, the Midwest, and the Mountain West. Besides, the report predicted 12 out of 50 American states for where she might have lived. This did not help the search any further. Finally, in March 2022, a private DNA lab, Ulthram, was contracted by GBI's Sylvester Regional Investigative Office and the FBI to perform DNA analysis. Ulthram received the remains of Jane Doe that were exhumed in 2012. It took 10 months to create a DNA profile for Jane Doe of Baker County. After the DNA profiling was done, the results were given to the FBI to carry out genealogical comparisons. In January, the results yielded a high probability that she was Mary Anga Angie Cowan as her DNA profile matched one of her children. When finally contacted after 37 years, the family of Mary Cowan welcomed this news with mixed emotions. 
Born to Davis Owens Dave Hammond and Elizabeth Marie Bess Clark Hammond on 13 December 1965 in Gary, Indiana, Mary Angus, Angie Hammond Hall Cowan was the only girl among her five siblings. Denny, Drew, Jeff, Tim, and David. She was the second youngest child. David, her eldest brother, died in Vietnam in 1966. The family later moved to Florida. Mary Angie Cowan married Peter Irvin Hall and had two daughters. She then married Carl Kenneth Cowan and had two sons with him. She was separated from Carl Kenneth at the time of her disappearance. Her children held a warm memory of their mother for decades. They remembered her being fun and silly with them. She took care of all of her four children with the utmost love and priority. But one day, everything changed for the Cowan family. The story of Mary Cowan takes us back to May of 1985. On a warm day in central Florida in Seminole County, a 28-year-old Mary was living with her four children. One of her children, Daniel, recalled that they used to live somewhere around a sandy road. He was just seven years old at the time, so he couldn't remember the exact location or the date of the event, but he remembered his mom's yellow Toyota being stuck in the sand. She couldn't take the car out of it alone, so Daniel asked a friend to come over and help. For some reason, the family friends could not show up that night. However, the family did arrive the next day and saw the car parked outside still very much inside the sand. But Mary Cowan was nowhere around. So they looked inside the house for her, but she did not answer. There was food on the stove, so they waited for her to come back from wherever she had gone. Things in her house seemed like she had gone out for a minute and would be returning soon. When they didn't hear from her for quite a while, they went around the house looking for her. They searched, then waited for her to come back, then searched again. But there was no sign of her. The family that had come over to help Mary Cowan found her purse and ID on the counter. Daniel, Mary Cowan's son, said in a recent interview they tried filing a report with the local police station but it was the 1980s and the rules were different than they are now. She was a 28-year-old adult at the time she went missing, therefore, no official missing persons report was filed. Could this be why Mary Cowan went unidentified for almost four decades to come? The two stories of a missing mom of Seminole County and an injured woman of Baker County had been separate until now. After 37 years, Jane Doe has finally been identified as Mary Angus Cowan, the missing Florida mom of four. About four decades of tedious probes led the investigators to Mary Anga Cowan. But the lack of leads, witnesses, and evidence resulted in rendering the manner of death as accidental. After 37 years considering her death accidental, the police are ready to move forward and close the case of Mary Cowan. Daniel and Angelique, the children of Mary Cowan, were contacted. They showed the utmost gratification toward the police and the Newton community for their instrumental help in bringing their mother home. They were 7 and 10 years old when Mary went missing. In their childhood, Daniel and Angelique, along with their siblings, were told that their mother had abandoned them, but their grandmother Elizabeth Hammond always believed that her Angie would come back one day. Unfortunately, Mary Cowan's parents died before she could return home. The family still hopes to bring the remains of Mary Cowan to a shared grave with her mother, Elizabeth, in Edgewood, Greenwood, in Popeka. Do you think Mary Cowan's death was accidental? Is there any possibility of foul play in the case of Baker County Jane Doe? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. On January 7, 1972, 19-year-old Nancy Elaine Anderson was found dead in her apartment in Waikiki, Hawaii. She had sustained 63 brutal stab wounds, three of them being severe lacerations. The case was initially suspected to be a suicide but turned into something else entirely once these injuries were noticed. The investigation that followed was long and winding and would span decades until a breakthrough in 2022. Who killed Nancy? How did the police crack the case after all these years? We are looking at the 50-year-old cold case of Anderson that was finally solved in 2022. But before that, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. Now without any further ado, let's dive into the story. Nestled in Honolulu, the capital city of Hawaii, the neighborhood of Waikiki is a major tourist attraction for recreation activities and holiday enjoyment. The white sand beaches fascinate people from all over the world. The tropical climate, mystical landscapes, and sunny beaches make every day seem like a fun holiday to local residents. Apart from Waikiki's reputation as the perfect place for vacation, it is also famous for a case that horrified the country in 1972. 
Born to Myrtle Van Anderson and Thelma Bernice Brown Anderson on November 10, 1952, Nancy Elaine Anderson was an amicable person. She was one of ten siblings and grew up in a large household full of love and laughter. Born in Bay City, Bay County, Michigan, she wanted to taste the life of the islands after graduating from John Glenn High School in 1970. She had always wanted to experience the thrill and adventure of island life. Before she started college, she wanted to experience this life she had always wanted. She moved to Hawaii in October 1971 to live in an apartment at 2222 Aloha Drive in Waikiki and got a job at a McDonald's at the Ala Moana Center. Nancy was very friendly and too trusting with strangers according to her roommate Jody. Her outgoing nature and amiable personality seemed to raise caution in the eyes of her friends, colleagues, and family. Everyone in her life stated that she dated several different men which seemed to raise red flags around 19-year-old Nancy's choices. At work, however, her manager Pedro Rapolio remembered her as a dependable and friendly employee. A co-worker, Julie Torres, believed that she was not promiscuous but was too friendly. No one would imagine that her friendly conduct could lead her to a ruthless death. She went back to her hometown in Michigan for Christmas and New Year's that year to visit her family. She returned to Waikiki a few days into the new year unaware of what awaited her. It had barely been two months since she had moved to Hawaii to live her dream life, but it ended on January 7, 1972 when she was brutally stabbed to death. Jody Spooner, Nancy's roommate in Hawaii, returned home from shopping at 2.30 p.m. on January 7 to find two unknown men selling silverware to Nancy. Jody sat down with Nancy to watch their demonstration, but neither of them ended up buying anything. After talking to Nancy for 10 minutes, Jody went to her bedroom to take a nap around 2.40 to 2.50 p.m. Even though Nancy and Jody were on good terms and had a friendly relationship, Jody liked to keep to herself as Nancy often invited random strangers over. She believed that Nancy was too trusting and she talked to strangers without any regard for her safety. Jody recalls that all the doors to the apartment were closed and locked when she went for a nap. As she drifted to sleep, Jody could hear the radio from Nancy's bedroom and the sound of running water from her bathroom. When she woke up around 5.15 and went to the kitchen, she still heard the noise of running water coming from Nancy's bedroom, the door to which was now standing ajar. When Jody proceeded to enter the room, there on the floor, she found her roommate covered in blood. Believing it was suicide, she rushed to her neighbors to ask for help in calling the police. The 19-year-old girl from Michigan lay still in a pool of blood and no one knew how her life had ended. It was the evening of January 7, 1972. Hawaii Police Department officers Mitten Galise and George Gibbons received a call around 5.29 p.m. about a possible suicide at apartment 704, 2222 Aloha Drive, Coral Terrace Apartments, Honolulu. Just as the police entered the apartment, they found a blood-stained blue and white towel near the entrance. When they entered the bedroom, they found Nancy lying unresponsive on the floor. Police found traces of blood on the bed in the bathroom, too. Everyone was horrified by the brutal death of Nancy. The ambulance was called, but at approximately 6.01 p.m., she was pronounced dead by the physician. While Nancy Anderson was being violently lain in her small apartment, her roommate Jody Spooner, who was still inside, heard nothing loud enough to wake her from her nap. None of the neighbors saw or noticed anything unusual either. No one saw anyone coming in or going out. This case was as peculiar as it could be. The police were searching for clues everywhere, but there was very little to go on. Detective George Cruz noticed several puncture wounds on Nancy's sternum, chest, abdomen, and both thighs. Another officer noticed that her blouse was torn around her right armpit and her bra was visible. Autopsy confirmed that there were puncture wounds on her left forearm, lacerations on her upper left arm, and blood under the fingernails of both hands. The autopsy report stated that Nancy was stabbed using a paring or penknife 60 times and she sustained 63 wounds, three of them being exit wounds. Nancy's death was caused by hemorrhage due to a stab wound to the heart. The instrument used was predicted to be about 10 millimeters wide and 60 millimeters long. The description of the murder instrument did not match any of the knives in Nancy's apartment. In the autopsy report, there was no trace of drugs or alcohol in her body. However, the presence of spermatozoa was confirmed, but this could just be an indicator of an active sexual life. The police relied on the recovered evidence at the crime scene to find clues. They found a bedspread, three towels, and two slippers at the scene that had blood on them. 
They believed that the stabbing got so violent at one point that the attacker's hand slid off the blade and received a substantial cut. The attacker then used the towel to wipe off excess blood. Police also believed that the wound on Nancy's thumb was likely inflicted in self-defense. Not only was the killer out of reach, but the murderer's motive was just as vague. Nothing was missing from the house, which meant it was not a robbery. Nancy's sweet and friendly nature also meant that she hardly harbored any enemies. It was already getting difficult for the police to find new leads in this case. However, they did have a few suspects to take a closer look at. The last people to leave Nancy's apartment 74 were the two salesmen, Parker Graham and Jeffrey Allward. They were called in for an interrogation. They had a detailed account of how they set up a meeting with Nancy. The presentation started around 1.30 or 1.45 p.m. and when Nancy and her roommate were not interested in the products, they gave them a pie cutter and left the building without going anywhere else. Both Parker and Jeffrey voluntarily provided their fingerprints, which did not match any of those obtained at the crime scene. Their polygraph test validated their initial statements. When this did not lead anywhere, police followed up on statements given by Jody's boyfriend, Kim Weaver. He said that Nancy would often invite strangers to the apartment and hang out with weird-looking men. He did not know the names of the guys with whom Nancy was often around, but he had given them nicknames like Frenchman, Reno, Nevada, Cowboy, and Dude from Detroit. The investigators checked out these people and their alibis. Reno, Nevada was William Manor who dated Nancy but had never engaged in anything more intimate than kissing. He said that he did not visit her in the apartment and knew nothing about who could have been responsible for the murder. Stephanie Fraser, who lived at 2223 Alawai Boulevard, which was the neighboring building to Aloha Drive, witnessed a commotion the day the murder took place. She saw a car in the upper-level parking lot and a Caucasian couple could be overheard arguing in the car. After 15 minutes, they left the vehicle, but Stephanie could not see whether they moved into the street or they entered the building. She described the male as tan-skinned, 5 feet 9 inches to 5 feet 10 inches inches tall, 25 years old with dark brown curly hair. She believed the woman was in her 20s and had shoulder-length, dirty blonde hair. When shown multiple pictures of possible suspects, she identified a mutual friend of Jody and Kim, Richard Hacker, as the man she saw arguing in the car, however, she was not positive. Later, when the police questioned Nancy's co-workers, one of her colleagues, Karen Sullivan, revealed that Nancy had informed her during one of their lunch breaks that she had once dated a member of the mafia back home. But nothing of importance could be found and verified. The police found a Bank of Hawaii savings passbook in her purse. It said she opened an account hours before her death on January 7th. The interrogation with Paula Meyer, the bank teller, revealed that she returned from her lunch break around 2.15 and estimated that Nancy would have opened the account between 2.15 and 3 p.m. Neighbors, boyfriends, roommates, salesmen, property managers, colleagues, and family were questioned. But none of the suspects or leads the police had ended up going anywhere. Eventually, the case went cold. For the last 50 years, a number of tips and fruitless clues appeared and vanished, but police still could not find a solid suspect in the case of the murder of Nancy Anderson. However, the police department did not give up on the case of Nancy Anderson. New developments in science and technology motivated them to dig deeper and find new answers. During 2001 to 2003, blood samples found in 1972 were used to build three DNA profiles, two of males and the remaining of a woman. Everyone involved in the case was tested and ruled out as a suspect again. The fate of Nancy Anderson changed when Honolulu police received a tip in December 2021 that 77-year-old Tudor Chirilla Jr. may have been connected to the murder. The Honolulu Police Department tested DNA found at the crime and contracted Parabon Nano Labs, a DNA technology company located in Virginia to help out with this case. The genetic genealogists used DNA phenotyping to generate trait predictions of the suspect as he might have looked at the age of 25. Cheriella resided in Reno, Nevada in 2021. Therefore, the Reno Police Department was alerted about the new development in the case. They tried getting his DNA covertly but failed after weeks of surveillance. Tutorilla's biological son, John Cherilla, was then contacted in March 2022 to assist in getting a DNA sample. On May 5, 2022, the forensic report confirmed that the DNA sample of John Chirilla was related to the DNA found at the crime site. It revealed that John Chirilla was the son of the person who was present in Nancy's room, thereby proving that Tudor Chirilla, John's father, was involved in the case.
Tuta Chirila's DNA sample matched the initial profiles found in Nancy's bedroom. This was a major breakthrough in the case of Nancy Anderson, which had only turned colder over the years. According to genetic genealogy, the suspect would have been around 25 years old at the time of the crime. As it turns out, Tudor, born on April 15, 1945, would have been 27 years old in 1972 when Nancy was murdered. He worked as a graduate assistant at the University of Hawaii at that time and used to live on Canal Street, which was within three miles from Nancy's apartment. After her death, he left Hawaii and graduated from law school. Tudor then worked as Deputy Attorney General in Nevada. He is listed as a long-term attorney in the Silver State working under Attorney General Richard H. Bryan in the areas surrounding Reno, Carson City, and Lake Tahoe. He lost the election to the state Supreme Court of Nevada in 1994. The cases that involve Tudor as a litigant are taxation or estate-related matters. Nancy Anderson's case is not the first that involves Tudor Terriella. In 1971, he reported that his car had been stolen. Later, he filed a complaint that the contents of his car were missing after he recovered it. Again, in 1995, then 50-year-old Tudor had a complaint filed against him that accused him of kidnapping, tying, and attempting to rape his then-girlfriend. However, the charges were dropped. In 1998, his name arose as an affiliation to the Mustang brothel owned by Joseph Conforte, Nevada's brothel boss. U.S. prosecutors identified him as the former president of Corp, which acted as a front for Joseph. They were allegedly involved in a conspiracy to defraud the government. In 2022, after 50 long years, justice prevailed for Nancy, and the first arrest in the case was finally made, and Tudor Chirila was charged with her murder. On September 6, 2022, detectives served a search warrant located Tudor Chirilla at his residence and collected his DNA sample using a buckle swab. Just two days later, Tudor attempted to take his own life, but he survived. The results allegedly linked Tudor to the murder of Nancy Anderson. After the confirmation, a non-bailable arrest warrant was released. Tudor Chirilla Jr. was finally in police custody for the fatal killing of Nancy Anderson. He was kept in Washoe County Jail in Reno, Nevada. He was later extradited to Honolulu where he pleaded not guilty to the crime of second-degree murder of Nancy. His bail is set at $1 million. Further trials are pending in the case, but the investigation is active and ongoing. Fifty years went by, but the Anderson family did not lose hope. The police department did not forget the vicious murder of the young 19-year-old Nancy Elaine Anderson. Now that a confirmed suspect has been arrested, justice for Nancy is not too far away. Developed technology and advanced genetic genealogy finally revealed the identity of the killer who had stabbed her more than 60 times. What could have been the possible motive for the killing? Do you think other people were involved in the murder of Nancy Anderson? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. September 12, 1988 was a day that shook Lawrence, Massachusetts to its core. The lifeless body of a girl, just 11 years old, was found brutally stabbed to death and abandoned on the train tracks near the Boston and Main Railway Yard. Her name was Melissa Trenley, and her senseless murder left the community reeling with shock, anger, and sadness. Who could have committed such a heinous act? How did they finally catch him after 35 years? We're taking a closer look at a 35-year-old cold case finally solved in 2023 in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Buckle up and get ready to join us on a journey into the unknown. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel by now, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Without further ado, let's get to the story. Nestled along the winding banks of the Merrimack River, Lawrence is a vibrant and thriving city that captures the essence of small-town charm with big-city excitement. The city's pulse beats with the energy of its diverse and passionate residents whose pride and joy, their beloved community, are palpable in every corner of the town. As you walk down the bustling streets of Lawrence, you can't help but feel a sense of history and heritage seeping through every brick and stone. This is the same town that played a pivotal role in American labor history where the Bread and Roses strike of 1912 marked a significant turning point for workers' rights and social justice. But it was here that a horrific crime took place in 1988. Melissa Tremley was born in 1977 to her mother Janet Tremley in Salem, Massachusetts. Her mother Janet raised her as a single mother on her own as her father was never in the picture and his identity remains unknown till this day. Melissa went by the nickname Missy and attended Lancaster School. 
Everyone who knew Melissa as a child described her as a fun-loving, carefree, and caring little girl who had many friends in school and was always ready to play games and have a good time. Melissa was a happy child who loved to play and explore her surroundings. One of her favorite places to play was the old Boston and Main Railway Yard, where she would often spend hours running and jumping around the train tracks while her mother visited friends at a nearby social club. Sadly, this would also be what led to her demise. On September 11, 1988, Melissa accompanied her mother and her boyfriend to the La Salle Social Club in Lawrence, not far from the railway where she was found and went outside to play while the adults stayed inside. The last sightings of her alive were made by a railroad employee and a pizza delivery driver who were in the vicinity, both who saw her within the late afternoon hours of that day. When Janet realized her daughter was missing, she frantically searched the area before reporting her missing to the police at around 9 p.m. that night. She returned home in a state of panic, hoping and praying for news of her daughter's safety. Unfortunately, she would never receive this news. On the morning of September 12, 1988, Melissa was found dead in the old Boston and Main Railway Yard in Lawrence. She had been stabbed to death and her leg was amputated post-mortem when a train ran over her body. The detectives who arrived on the scene theorized that the killer had likely done this in the hopes of mangling the body and removing any possible physical evidence they had left behind. The state police and Lawrence police launched a massive investigation into Melissa's death. They combed through every inch of the railroad yard and scoured other places, including the Lancaster Grammar School where Melissa was a student. The community was in shock and disbelief that such a heinous crime could happen in their small town. The lead detective on the case was Lawrence Police Officer Detective Thomas Murphy. He was shocked at the brutality of the murder and decided to relentlessly pursue justice for Melissa. He and his team recovered physical evidence from the body and at the crime scene, but the nature of this evidence was never revealed. However, the forensic team that analyzed the body found that the nature of her stab wounds indicated that her killer was left-handed. Since no arrests were made at the time, it is assumed that the evidence they gathered was not viable to be used in the investigation then, which is why it was shelved for later when forensic technology would develop enough for it to be used. Numerous witnesses, suspects, and persons of interest were interviewed by the police and the only lead they found was that there was a suspicious-looking van in the area Melissa was in the day she was murdered. But when they inquired further, no one was able to help them identify the van or owner. Despite their exhaustive efforts, the police were unable to find Melissa's killer. The killer remained at large and the community remained in fear. Melissa's family and friends were left to mourn their loss and try to come to terms with the unimaginable tragedy that had befallen them. And as time went by, they found no new leads. The case remained unsolved and eventually the trail went cold. Finally, in 2014, over 25 years after the death of Melissa, the cold case was re-examined by authorities. And lead investigator Lt. Peter Sherva decided that the case should be reopened. After going over the old case files and reviewing the evidence left behind from the original investigation, the detectives knew what they had to do. A few years later, the evidence recovered from Melissa's body was submitted for testing. And in 2022, 33 years later, detectives finally had a suspect. On April 26, 2022, 74-year-old Marvin McClendon Jr., a former Massachusetts corrections officer, was arrested in his home in Bremen, Alabama for her murder by the Alabama State Police. While the nature of the evidence that was used to ascertain his guilt was never released to the public, the press release did state that the evidence recovered from the body was crucial in identifying him as a suspect. And then when detectives probed deeper into his life, a whole set of incriminating details came to light. Although it is not clear how McClendon became a suspect in the case or how the DNA testing was carried out. The result was a resounding success for the tireless work of investigators and law enforcement officials who had been working tirelessly to solve the case for over three decades. Thanks to the DNA evidence, investigators were able to track McClendon down to his home in Bremen, Alabama, where he was promptly arrested and charged with being a fugitive from justice. The arrest was made on the evening of April 26, 2022, and marked the culmination of years of hard work, determination, and dedication on the part of law enforcement officials and investigators. While the details of how McClendon was finally brought to justice remain unclear, what is certain is that the use of DNA evidence has played a critical role in solving this long-standing cold case. McClendon was a retired Massachusetts Department of Corrections employee, but he wasn't working for the state in 1988. 
He worked for the state on three separate occasions from 1970 to 2002, but at the time of the murder was involved in carpentry work in Chelmsford, a locality close to Lawrence. Investigators discovered that McClendon had several connections to Lawrence, a nearby town where the young girl's lifeless body was found near a set of train tracks. Their investigation revealed that McClendon frequented various locations within Lawrence, including the Seventh-day Adventist church situated on Salem Street. He also had a van that looked like one that witnesses saw Melissa and Nir on the day she disappeared. These findings shed light on McClendon's proximity to the location of the murder, prompting further inquiry into his possible involvement in the crime. In the year 1988, McClendon, who was at the age of 41, had gained a reputation for being an individual with an uncontrollable temper and was known to have a violent and aggressive nature under the influence of alcohol. He was reported to have frequently visited strip clubs where he would engage in activities deemed inappropriate and disrespectful towards women. Furthermore, he was known to have indulged in sexual relations with women in the back of his van, which added to his already tarnished image. These facts were previously presented in a court hearing by Strasnick, his brother. Mr. McClendon was represented in his trial by a court-appointed attorney, Mr. Fazel, since his arrest. However, during a hearing, a probation employee testified that Mr. McClendon did not meet the criteria for appointed counsel during a hearing regarding the motion to dismiss by Henry Fazel, McClendon's defense attorney, McClendon's own brother. Strasnick argued against the motion. He presented evidence to counter Fazel's claim that the DNA evidence collected was not sufficient to support a first-degree murder indictment against his client. According to court documents, the lawyer representing McClendon pointed out that his client had voluntarily provided a DNA sample to investigators during his initial interview with Massachusetts State Police Lieutenant. Lieutenant Peter Sherber, which took place in Alabama back in 2021. Despite using a walker, McClendon made his way into the courtroom in Salem Superior Court on Tuesday where he was seated next to his attorney Fazel. In the month of April in the year 2022, during a follow-up interview conducted by the authorities, McClendon vehemently denied any involvement in the tragic demise of Melissa. He asserted that he was innocent of the accusations that had been laid upon him and even insinuated that he might have been the victim of a carefully orchestrated plot by inmates from the Department of Corrections in Massachusetts where he had worked. Such a statement was not only a blatant attempt to deflect the blame but also a preposterous attempt to mislead the authorities. Strasnick pointed out that the DNA evidence was collected from the crime scene and matched the DNA profile of a male relative of McClendon. He argued that the probability of the DNA belonging to someone else other than McClendon was extremely low. Furthermore, he stated that the DNA evidence was only one piece of evidence in the case and that there were other factors that supported the indictment against his brother. McClendon's attempts to absolve himself of any responsibility did not stop there. He went on to shift the blame to his own flesh and blood, his brother Strasnick, in an act of treacherous betrayal that demonstrated his willingness to throw anyone under the bus to save his own skin. His attempts to paint his own kin as the mastermind behind the crime spoke volumes about his own lack of loyalty and trustworthiness. Strasnick vehemently opposed the claim that his brother was a factually innocent person. He provided examples of McClendon's erratic behavior leading up to and following the murder and argued that these actions were indicative of guilt. He also stated that McClendon had a history of violence, as aforementioned, which made him a likely suspect in the murder case. This statement by Fassault indicates that the investigation centered on McClendon instead of his family members due to specific pieces of evidence that were available at the time. These included Mr. McClendon's left-handedness, his potential ties to Lawrence, his possession of a van in 1988, his lifestyle at the time, and his interactions with law enforcement during the investigation. However, the statement sounded suspicious and this explanation was likely an attempt to absolve Mr. McClendon of any wrongdoing and may have been a calculated and misleading move. During the court hearing, Judge Salim to be presided over a motion to dismiss the case against the defendant, Mr. McClendon, who had been charged with first-degree murder. The judge listened carefully to the arguments presented in the motion and took the matter under advisement, refraining from making an immediate decision. It is worth noting that the charge of first-degree murder is a very serious offense and carries the potential penalty of life in prison without the possibility of parole. As such, this case is being closely watched by all parties involved and the outcome of the upcoming hearing will likely have a significant impact on the course of the trial. 
Fazolt has attempted in vain to secure McClendon's release on a $50,000 bond. At Middleton Jail, he is still being held without bond. Fazolt also stated that there were no eyewitnesses to the murder of Trumbly and there was no evidence to suggest that McClendon knew her or had any motive to harm her. Despite this, McClendon has been held in protective custody in a cell at Middleton Jail. As part of his confinement, he is not allowed to leave his cell unless accompanied by a guard. This precautionary measure has been taken to ensure McClendon's safety and the safety of others given the high-profile nature of the case and the potential risks associated with his involvement in it. By keeping him in protective custody, authorities can closely monitor his movements and interactions to prevent any potential harm or disturbance within the jail or outside. According to Sherry Carrigan, a friend of Melissa who was present at McClendon's arraignment, she was only 10 years old when the crime occurred. And when she saw the defendant, she imagined a different person than what she saw in court. She described McClendon as a frail, old man. A day after she was reported missing, the family had never expected that it would take 33 and a half years to see someone arrested and brought before a judge for Melissa's murder. Despite this delay, the family is confident that the district attorney's office will be just as dedicated to prosecuting the case as the detectives were in their years-long search for the suspect, Marvin McClendon. According to a statement, Root stated that there had been a lot of emotions since the end of April when they were informed of the arrest, ranging from excitement to sadness to frustration and all over the place. They were thrilled to see the suspect in jail but also very saddened that some of their family members, such as their aunt, grandfather, and others were not alive to witness him facing justice. The statement went on to express gratitude to the police for their ongoing efforts throughout the years and for the use of DNA technology that was not originally available to work the case. Root finished by saying that their family was looking forward to the case moving forward to the grand jury for indictment and then on to the superior court to finally see justice served. Thank you for watching this video on how DNA has revolutionized the field of forensic investigation and helped solve numerous cold cases that had remained unsolved for years. As you have seen, DNA technology has been a boon for law enforcement agencies, allowing them to identify and apprehend perpetrators of heinous crimes that had remained undetected for decades. With the help of DNA evidence, investigators can now link suspects to crime scenes, identify victims who had remained unidentified, and even exonerate innocent people who had been wrongfully accused and convicted. This has not only brought closure to families of victims, but also ensured that the perpetrators are held accountable for their actions. How long can one hold on to that hope before it fades away? And what happens when the answer finally comes? These are the questions that plague us all at some point in our lives. 21 years ago, on a quiet night in March of 2002, a 39-year-old woman named Sharon Van Gilder was last seen leaving a bar in Tacoma, Washington. Little did anyone know that her departure from the bar that night would be the last time anyone saw her alive? Who could have done this to an innocent woman? Was it someone she knew who was responsible for her death? We are looking at the 21-year-old cold case of Sharon Van Gilder that was finally solved in 2021. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now without any further ado, let's dive into the mystery. Tacoma is a port town in Washington state on the banks of the Puget Sound south of Seattle. Its vibrant urban core is alive with culture. When you visit Tacoma, you're in for a treat. This city is a hub of creativity and culture and is known around the world for its stunning glass art. As you wander through the city's vibrant urban core, you'll be struck by the sense of energy and vitality that permeates the community. Tacoma's must-see attractions include the Museum of Glass featuring works by Dale Chihuly and dazzling installations on the Chihuly Bridge of Glass, and the Tacoma Art Museum showcasing the region's diverse artistic traditions and contemporary trends. The friendly city enwires many to celebrate the melding of old and new, but not everything is as transparent as glass. It is here in Tacoma, Washington, that our case begins. Sharon Van Gild was born in 1963 in the United States of America. Growing up in Enumclaw, Washington, Sharon had a large family that included several siblings. In 2002, she was a beloved member of her community in Tacoma and was a devoted mother to her son and daughter. Her kind and amiable nature earned her many friends who spoke highly of her after her disappearance in March of 2002. Those who knew her were particularly fond of her and had nothing but good things to say about her character. Little did they know that the joyous woman would soon be leaving their lives and they would have to bid her farewell. It was an unremarkable March evening in 2002 when Sharon was seen leaving a bar with a man. 
Despite having a few drinks, Sharon didn't appear to be in any trouble and nothing suspicious was observed by those who witnessed her departure. Unfortunately, it would turn out to be the last time anyone would see Sharon alive and cheerful. Barely two hours had passed since Sharon was last seen leaving the bar in Tacoma when an unclothed body was discovered on the side of the road near 156006 Street East and 704th Avenue East. The shocking discovery stunned the community and speculation ran rampant about the identity of the deceased and the circumstances leading up to their tragic demise. The swift and brutal turn of events raised more questions than answers, leaving investigators scrambling to piece together what happened in those two fateful hours. The mystery of the identity of the body found on the side of the road in Tacoma, Washington was finally solved when the Pierce County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed that it was Sharon's body. The confirmation was made by matching her fingerprints, bringing a sense of resolution, but also raising new questions about what could have happened to the cheerful woman seen leaving a bar only a couple of hours before her death. The discovery of Sharon's identity added another layer of complexity to the investigation, leaving the community wondering who could have committed such a heinous act and what the motive behind it could have been. With just an unclothed body lying on the side of the road in the 15600 block of 704th Avenue East, detectives could not find much evidence at the scene and there were no marks on the body, which led them to believe that the crime had happened at a different location. The autopsy report helped in identifying Sharon's body as well as in following up on potential suspects. Detectives were determined to solve the case of Sharon Van Gilder's murder. They spoke to witnesses who had seen Sharon leaving the bar with a Hispanic male on the night of her death. After conducting a thorough investigation, detectives discovered a hair on Sharon's body that belonged to a man and they suspected it was the man she had left with on the night as it matched the description they had of him. This discovery led them to consider him the primary suspect. Pierce County Sheriff's Department quickly identified Manuel Urbano Vasquez as the main murder suspect. However, he fled to Mexico before law enforcement was able to arrest him. Detectives were also unable to obtain a DNA profile from him to match with DNA found on Van Gilder's body. As the days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the case went cold. However, the detectives refused to give up and continued to work on the case hoping that someday they would find the answers they sought. Ten years later, the renewed investigation into the cold case of Sharon Van Gilder's murder began when the Pierce County Sheriff's Office created its cold case unit in 2012. Retired Detective Sergeant Tim Coble took on the case and discovered three sexual assaults that occurred in Tacoma around the same time as the homicide. With a thorough investigation and study of the three other sexual assault cases, he was able to connect the man who was last seen leaving the bar with Van Gilder to the sexual assaults. Thanks to advances in forensic technology, DNA profile from all four cases were matched to Manuel Urbano Vasquez for homicide and sexual assault. However, Urbano Vasquez had fled to Mexico in 2002 shortly after Sharon's death before detectives could obtain a DNA sample from him. With this new evidence, detectives were able to establish probable cause to arrest Urbano Vasquez for the murder of Van Gilder. The Pierce County Prosecutor's Office filed charges against him and a warrant was issued for his arrest. However, Urbano Vasquez remained at large for several years, causing anguish for the victim's family and law enforcement officials. In 2019, Urbano Quiz was located in Mexico by the FBI for the murder of Sharon Van Gilder and multiple sexual assault charges committed over two decades ago. Detective Sergeant Linnell Anderson spearheaded the application for extradition paperwork to bring Urbana Vasquez back to the U.S. to face trial. After a long and arduous process, the paperwork was finally processed in March 2023. Manuel Urbano Vasquez was arrested in Mexico on March 14, 2023 by the FBI and Mexican authorities after evading authorities for years. The FBI had located him in 2019 for the heinous crimes he committed more than 20 years ago in including the murder of Sharon and multiple sexual assault charges. The Mexican authorities provided crucial assistance in facilitating his arrest, working in conjunction with the Pierce County Prosecutor's Office Tacoma Police Detectives, Pierce County Sheriff Detectives, FBI, Interpol, the State Police Crime Lab, and the Assistant U.S. Attorney's Office. However, the legal battle bring Urbana Vasquez back to the U.S. is not over yet. According to the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, there will be more time before Urbano Vasquez is brought back to Pierce County to face trial. 
He will have hearings in Mexico to argue why he should not be deported, which could take six months or longer. Despite the challenges, the arrest of Urbana Vasquez is a significant step towards justice for the victims and their families. It is a testament to the unwavering dedication of law enforcement officials in pursuing fugitives who evade justice no matter how long it takes. The process of bringing Arbono Vasquez to trial may be complex, but it is a necessary step towards ensuring accountability for his heinous crime. This arrest marks the culmination of a long and difficult search for justice for the victims and their families. The apprehension of Arbono Vasquez serves as a reminder that law enforcement agencies remain vigilant in their pursuit of fugitives who evade the law. The tragedy of Sharon's death and the trauma inflicted upon the survivors of Urbano Vasquez's violent acts cannot be undone. But the arrest of the perpetrator brings some sense of closure and accountability. It is a testament to the perseverance and dedication of law enforcement officials who worked tirelessly to bring justice to victims of violent crimes. What happened that night before Sharon was murdered? Could things have been different had she not left with that man, or was it her destiny? What do you think might have been the motive of the killer? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section.